In our study of the physiology of how smaller pieces of a group interact with one another within that group to create a larger structure, our first step is to understand, in the first place, how do I take two groups and use them to piece together a larger group, which has each one of those as a subgroup. The construction we're going to study now is called the external direct product. It's one way of accomplishing this that turns out to be one of the more important and fundamental ways to do it. In this video, we'll define what an external direct product is and look at some examples. So the motivation for a direct product of groups is fairly straightforward. Let's suppose, for example, that I have the group Z mod 2, so the cyclic group of order 2, and the group Z mod 3, cyclic group of order 3. Each one of those groups has its own operation, its own structure, and kind of does its own thing. So what would happen if I took each of those two pieces, the Z mod 2 piece, the Z mod 3 piece, and I let them do their own thing in their separate universe, but just sort of kept track of what they were doing both together, so that they're not interacting with one another, but they're just doing their own thing in their own separate little sphere. So the idea would be, for example, that if I added 1 to my element over here in Z mod 2 that started at 0, and if I added 1 to my 0 over here in Z mod 3, then what's going to happen? Is it in Z mod 2, we're going to go up to 1. In Z mod 3, we're also going to go up to 1. So again, each of them is doing their own thing. But what happens if I add 1 on both of these groups once again? Well, Z mod 2, when I add 1 plus 1, we're going to come back around to 0. But in Z mod 3, when I add 1 plus 1, I'm going to go up to 2. So the picture here is that as I'm adding 1s, for example, to my Z mod 2 group and my Z mod 3 group, each one of them is doing its own thing. And so what we notice in this example, say, is if I start at zero on both of my two groups, so I start at the identity element in both of my two groups, and I add one once, twice, three times, four times, five times, and then the sixth time, I end up coming back around to the identity element in both groups. And all I had to do was just let each group have its own separate algebra, basically. And that's the idea behind the direct product of groups. But what we'll notice, in this example at least, is that even though Z mod 2 over here on the left side is a group of order 2, and Z mod 3 on the right side is a group of order 3, when I unite them in this construction where each is allowed to do its own thing, now the elements that I get, my 1 and 1 on both sides for example, that element can have an order that's bigger than the order of the group on the left and the order of the group on the right. That element here, the element 1, 1, has order 6 inside of this group. So clearly, when we do piece groups together in this way, by letting each one do its own algebra on its own sort of side of the I love Lucy house is divided down the center by this comma, right? We let each group do its own thing, but so somehow this larger structure is a lot more interesting, has a lot more possibilities than each one of the two pieces had on its own. So to define the external direct product of two groups G and H, Again, G and H can have their own separate algebras. So they have their own operation, um, and they have possibly totally different structures. And we'll define an external direct product of G and H, which is sometimes in different corners of algebra called a direct sum. I won't use that language, but in case I accidentally slip up, this is what I'm talking about. It's defined by G plus H, so this is where the sum language comes from. We use this symbol, this plus with a circle around it, to denote an external direct product. And it's just defined to be from the, the set level, it's the set of ordered pairs. So ordered pairs where the first element in the pair is an element of G, the second element in the pair is an element of H. So this is the I love Lucy house with the, the masking tape line down the center. Lucy stays on one side and uh, Ricky stays on the other side, right? Um, so these two groups get to do their own thing, uh, each in their own sort of part of this ordered pair. And the way it becomes a group is just that we use the operation of G on the elements of G in the first component and we use the operation of H on the elements of H in the second component. So that's all we're doing, is we're taking two groups which know how to do their own thing, and we're just sort of putting them side by side and letting them continue to do their own things. That's an external direct product of two groups. So here's an example. What would happen if I took Z mod 6, so the cyclic group of order 6, and Z mod 2, the cyclic group of order 2, and let them do their own thing? What does that end up looking like? Well, one way of understanding a direct product is by analogy to how we learned about the xy plane when we were first learning about how to graph in an algebra class long ago. You can kind of think of the z mod 6 coordinate as being like my x-axis. My z mod 2 is as making my y-axis. And so on the z mod 6 axis, I get the elements of z mod 6, the additive residues from 0 to 5, mod 6. And on the y-axis, I get the additive residues 0 and 1, mod 2. And then the elements 
of this direct product are going to be these 12 combinations, where I pick in my first coordinate one of these elements from 0 through 5 in Z mod 6, and in my second coordinate I get one of the elements 0 or 1 taken mod 2. And then how does the actual algebra work? Well, the algebra works component by component. So if I want to know, for example, how to add 3 comma 1 and 5 comma 1, each of these are elements of this direct uh, product, all I have to do is add the 3 and the 5 in the first component, add the 1 and the 1 in the second component, and when I say add, I mean add mod 6 in the first component and add mod 2 in the second component. And so the picture becomes, again, one something like this, where in Z mod 6, on one side of my uh, direct product, I've got the element 3. In Z mod 2, I've got the element 1 taken together in an ordered pair that gives me the element 3, 1 in the direct product of those two groups. If I then add the element 5, 1 to that, it's going to add 5 over here, it's going to add 1 over here. And the result is going to be, well, looks like 2, 0. And if we do out that arithmetic, we can see why that happens. When I add 3 plus 5 mod 6, I get 2. When I add 1 plus 1 mod 2, I get 0. So that's all. A direct product is just letting each of these two groups do its own thing on its own side of this ordered pair. And because of the way that we constructed the elements of this direct product, we're going to have as many elements in this direct product as there are elements in the Cartesian product of the sets G and H. We're going to have n choices of how many elements uh, that we put in the first component if n is the order of g, and we're going to have m choices for how many elements to put in the second component if they're m elements in h. So the order of a direct product, an external direct product, is just the product of the orders, and that's probably where we get the word product for this construction. So for example, z6 had six elements, z2 had two elements, so their external direct product is going to have six times two, or twelve elements in total. And again, that's still kind of an anatomy lesson. That just sort of tells me what these pieces look like. What do these external direct products look like? But well, we want more. We want a physiology lesson. We want to understand the different ways in which these pieces that we put together can interact to make the structure inside of this larger direct product group. So this is going to require us to ask questions like, is Z6 plus Z2, sorry, Z6 direct product Z2, is this group that we just looked at a second ago isomorphic to the group Z4 direct product Z3. After all, both of these groups, according to this order formula over here, both of them are going to have order 12. 6 times 2, 12. 4 times 3, 12. So these groups have the same number of elements. What can we say about their larger structure, about whether these groups are isomorphic one to another? And here's how I like to answer this question. Let's try and determine whether or not each of these groups is cyclic. After all, Z mod 6 is a cyclic group. For example, 1 is one of its generators. If I add 1 repeatedly, I'm going to account for every element in Z mod 6. Same thing with Z mod 2. 1 is a generator over there. So what happens if I take those 1s and I unite them together into a single ordered pair? Is 1, 1 going to be a generator for this direct product? Well, its first power is 1, 1. Its second power in this group is 2, 0. Third power is 3, uh, 3 1. And then 4, 0. And then 5, 1. And then, by the time we get to the sixth power of this element, we've come back around to the identity once again. So just by taking these generators of Z6 and Z2 and putting them together into a single ordered pair, we've actually failed to make a generator for this direct product group. In order to be a generator, its order as an element would have to be equal to the order of the whole group, which is 12. But the order here is only 6 for this element, so clearly that's not quite working for Z6 plus Z2. That doesn't mean that there might not be other generators that we haven't found, but that this tactic of taking the generators of each and trying to make a generator for the product doesn't work in Z6 direct product Z2. So what about the other group, Z4 direct product Z3? Does it work to take the generators of Z4 and Z3, for example, 1 and 1, respectively? Can I make a generator by putting those two together and make a generator of the larger group? Well, what's the first power of 1, 1? It's going to be 1, 1, as you would expect. The second power is going to be 2, 2. The third power is going to be 3, 0, because now my Z mod 3 has come back around to the identity. The fourth power is going to be 0, 1. Now my fourth uh, power has come back around to the identity over here, but we're not the identity over here on the right. Here's the fifth power. Here's the sixth power. Here's the seventh power. Here's the eighth power. Notice we still haven't gotten back around to the identity element of this product group. The ninth power, the tenth power, the eleventh power, and finally on the twelfth power we come back around to the identity. 
So evidently in Z4 cross Z3 we have found a generator. 1 comma 1 is a generator for this direct product group because its order, 12, is equal to the order of the product group, 12. And in fact that's going to give us our answer. These two groups are not isomorphic. So what we can find out is that Z4, direct product Z3, is in fact a cyclic group, but Z6, direct product Z2, is not. And to close, I want to give you one more picture as to why. So when we first met the group Z6, direct product Z2, we thought of it as the 12 points that we would get by taking the additive residues 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and the additive residues 0 and 1, respectively mod 6 and mod 2, and sort of laying them out on an xy grid. So another way to see what's happening when I take the element 1, 1 and I repeatedly add it to itself is just to see what happens on the xy plane when I go from 1, 1 to twice itself, which is 2, 2, to 3, 3, to 4, 4, to 5, 5, to 6, 6. Notice that once I get to 6, 6, I'm now at a place which is congruent to 0 mod 6 and it's also congruent to 0 mod 2. Therefore, all these blue points, they're congruent to uh, 0 mod 6 and 0 mod 2, these are all the identity element in my direct product groups. Same thing with all the elements back here. The first element is congruent to 0 mod 6, the second element is congruent to 0 mod 2. So all of the colored dots on this graph are the identity element in my product group. And so if I start with 1, 1, once I've gotten to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6th power of 1, 1, I've gotten back to the identity. But if I change this picture to instead look at Z4 direct product Z3, where in the first entry 4 and 0 are congruent, and in the second entry 0 and 3 are congruent, now what's going to happen if I start taking powers of 1, 1? How long before it comes back to one of these colored points, which is the identity element? Well, the first power is not, second power is not, third power is not, fourth, fifth, sixth, and it's at this point that we were already back to the identity in our previous example, but we're not. We're in between these two elements, so we keep going. Here's the seventh power. Here's the eighth power. Zoom out a little bit. Here's the ninth power, the tenth power, the eleventh power, and finally the twelfth power. So in Z4, direct product Z3, where all of my colored points here are now the identity element, once we reduce mod 4 in the x direction and mod 3 in the y direction, there, 1, 1 doesn't come back to the identity until we get all the way up to its twelfth power. What we want to do in our next video is to generalize this observation to first of all discuss how do we know what the order of an element in the direct product of two groups is. How does it relate to the order of the elements that we're putting together from their original groups? And then secondly, what does that tell us about the order of the direct product group itself? And more importantly, under what circumstances is that direct product of two cyclic groups going to be a cyclic group?